Hello everybody, and welcome to my 200th video special. This will be a long one all about the detailed history of the 4D XP and Mercury Allen 7. With more details and other information on things like production numbers, engine specifications, and other such details and information. Check out the 4D XP Wikipedia page that I regularly update. But for now, I'll, I'll cover almost everything I know at this moment. So grab your popcorn, and we'll get started. Towards the end of the 1970s, cars in North America were becoming more compact, and there was a rising demand for two-door so-called sports cars. Ironically, in the, the 80s would be the last great decade for your two-doors here in the States. Ford, like everyone else, had big plans for the 80s, the greatest of which would be the induction of their first world car with the Ford Escort. This would be their new body platform style, in addition to the young Fox platform and others that would appear over time. For most of Europe, the new Escort would be their MK3, Mark III, or third generation to us. For us in North America, this would be the first ever Escort from Ford, appropriately dubbed the first generation here by th enthusiasts alike. But from here on out, we won't be referencing any of foreign car models, just the North American cars to help keep things simple. The new Escort would, be, would debut in 1981 and would come in multiple arrangements to fit almost any purpose, but still have the same wheelbase, 94 inches across all of its body arrangements. That first year, there was a two-door hatchback, a four-door sedan, and a five-door five wagon with more bodies to come. At this time, Ford was already toying with the idea of adding another two-door to their lineup, a two-seater even. This would be Ford's first two-seat production car in America since the, since the 1950s Thunderbird. And like all two-seaters, it would be sporty, to some extent at least. This car would have to be special and appeal to a specific market. Ford decided on a affordable entry-level two-seater sports car for newlyweds, bachelors, and bachelorettes. The studies showed that fewer young families were having children over the next X many years. They also needed to keep costs down and keep the car affordable to buy, and it had to get good gas mileage for buyers to justify owning a sports car. This limited which cars and platforms they could use. The Fiesta wasn't around long enough, the LTD was far too big, and the Fox platform, including the future of Fairmont Mustang, etc., was not an affordable base. Also, there was worry that the new sports car would take away from the American icon, the Mustang, so Ford didn't want it to compare. The only th thing left was the new Escort. Yeah, it was small, nimble, affordable, and efficient. They would just need to make some tweaks to make it sportier and stand out better. We'll temporarily exit the timeline for a moment here, where you can have a quick look at the final production of the 1982 Mercury LN7, besides the 1983 Mercury Lynx RS. Both are near identical versions of their Ford counterparts, the EXP and Escort respectively. We'll get down to what separates the EXP from the LN7 later, but what made the EXP and LN7 so special is more important at the moment. Mechanically, these two cars above are entirely the same. They share the same 1.6-liter CVH four-cylinder, the same suspension, the same transmissions, the same steering, and the same brakes, though the EXP and LN7 had larger rear drums. Interior-wise, these cars were similar, the same seats, but on different tracks, with the EXP and LN7s being lower. The same dashboard and a similar console with similar door skins, but the EXP and LN7 didn't come with rear seats, though they were easily fitted due to the shared floor pan. All that being said, the critical parts of the unibody were the same. The entire floor pan is identical to that of the two-door Escort Lynx, and the front frame of the XP and LN7 is nearly identical to all Escorts and Lynxes, with the exception of the radiator support, where the top was reshaped a little bit to fit the XP and LN7 hood. The rest between the cars is different. The EXP and LN7 had more instrumentation in the center console, or at least they did for 1982 and 83. They also had a larger hatch, which changed the shape of the corner windows. They also had bigger taillights, famous front clip and molded bumpers, and lastly the roof was lowered about 2 inches, so subsequently the windshield had to be tilted back, and the window frames of the doors were changed, thus making them different from escort doors. We'll see in the prototypes that the unibody was the same as the production car, but the removable body parts would see variations throughout the prototype phases. 
But back to our timeline. A few prototypes were constructed in 1980. Some hardly resemble the EXP at all, like the top right Targa car. This might have been a prototype for the body change in late 1985, but we're unsure. The other three photos I've included are all built with the same unibody EXPs and LN7s had, but these wear unique bumpers, spoilers, and a sleeker front clip that would later be seen on a very rare pace car come 1982. In late 1980 and early 1981, the designs were mostly finalized with some small changes to be made before production took place. These 10 to 12 cars were all EXPs that would all be featured in a promotional catalog for unknown purposes, as the only catalog copies of these ended up in a Soviet website online. And we know it wasn't f for them specifically because EXPs and LN7s were only made in North America for North America. On the right, you can see a photo taken at the St. Thomas assembly plant where 10 to 12 front clips are being inspected and ready for assembly onto these new prototypes. The top photo shows how they would look once installed. You can see that EXP is entire, in its entirety to the left. There are a few notable differences between these cars and the actual production cars. The nose cone was the biggest difference. In these photos, you can see it's the same shape as what would come, but it lacks the EXP's two slat grill or for the LN7, the 10 slant grill. It had also had different badging, where the Ford Oval, or the Mercury Cougar Lynx circlet would be, is instead just a round badge that, when enlarged, is more or less a blank buckle. And with it not being 1982 yet, there wouldn't be any blue ovals anyways. So to the right, you can see the Ford emblem in the plain GT40 race script letters. Next big difference is rather obvious. You can see a pair of louvered vents on the hoods. These were more cosmetic than fun functional, but it would help evacuate some hot air from underneath the hood around the radiator, as EXPs and LN7s don't get, don't get the best cooling and air charge due to the shape of the nose cone. Also, half of these EXPs had bubble backs, which would only be on LN7s for 1982 and 1983, and then find their way on the EXPs from 1984 through 1988. You can also see the taillights are completely red. These would have black around the reverse lens for the 82 and 83 EXP. Then for all LN7s and 84 through 88 EXPs, the taillights would be almost completely black. Careful look also reveals slightly different corner bumpers and a unique badging on the front quarters. Some had 1.6 liter EFI, and SS badges, even though only the EFI badge would make its way onto select 83 through 88 EXPs, LN7s, Escort Lynxes, and so forth. On February 16, 1981, the first production EXP and LN7 left the line together at St. Thomas, Ontario. Though at least 12 EXPs were produced prior to the production EXPs, and as seen in the pre-production catalog I had mentioned earlier, and one had most of the revised parts for advertising closer to the release. You can see it above. It is correct in every way, except the nose cone still lacks the grill inlets, so they painted black where they would be, or had applied black tape where they would eventually wind up. One of my EXPs has a production date of January 26, 1981, stamped on its bumper, even though its VIN says it's EXP 8300 and something. I'm still looking into it, but I believe it was one of the 10, or 10 to 12 catalog prototypes that got revinned instead of being destroyed. And the fact that my EXP is also a factory convertible thickens the plot some too. We'll talk about this more later. All of 1981 was the production of 82 model EXPs and LN7s. They'd see some changes halfway through 1981 affecting half of the 82 models course, but the cars were still almost entirely the same. The first year had a bunch of options and a dozen vibrant body colors to choose from. The XP and LN7 came in those same colors, but differed in a few big ways. The XP's red taillights were black on the LN7. The XP's notch back was a full bubble back hatch on the LN7. The EXP's two-slot grille was enlarged to 10 slots on the LN7, and the C-pillar sail panel differed with the LN7s being fanned, while the EXPs had a tic-tac-toe pattern. 
All in sevens typically had larger door bumper guards that matched the wraparound bumpers, while EXPs had thinner door bumpers. Those were more or less all the differences between the two cars, but know that the LN7 costed more and are typically found with more premier options like automatic transmissions, vinyl seats, etc. Something to note is that the 4-speed at the time had three different gear sets to choose from before the 5-speeds would be released in the following year, 1983. Also, a TR suspension package was optional, granting better struts and springs, as well as Michelin TRX 365R metric tires and wheels. 1983 would have the most options for the EXP and LN7, including all of the options from 1982, in addition to a center armrest, optional color dashboard, optional 5-speed, standard 4-speed, or an optional automatic, as well as a total of three engine options, being the carbureted 1.6 at 70 horsepower, the revised carburetor 1.6, high, higher output at 80 horsepower, and the new 1.6 EFI at 80 horsepower. This would also be the last year of production for the LN7s after just 40,000 were produced. 1984 was a big change for EXPs and Escorts as a whole, so big that I feel it should be referred to as Gen 1.5. Ford was to release the midsize Tempo as part of the Escort body platform this that year. Just like the EXP, the Tempo would be mechanically the same as the Escort and share the same floor pan, but the entire bodywork would be completely different. The Tempo turned out a little wider, and with its new mid-sized body and heavier weight due to its exterior body shape and interior features, that it required stronger powertrain, stronger drivetrain, revised motor and training mounts, and stronger suspension. And all being shared platform cars, the Escorts and the XBs had also gotten the updated transmissions, mounts, and related suspension. These had also resolved the 83 um, 82 and 81 issues with excessive wear on front tires, as you can see in the top center photo. It would be revised to the system shown in the photo right below. But the Escorts and EXP still only had the 1.6 CVH, though the Escorts would have the Tempo Diesel as option. Escorts also saw a change across the board for interiors, which you can see in the center. The previous square dashboard was replaced with a more rounded dashboard without any lower instrumentation most commonly found in the stereotypical 80s gray. Door speakers would be a new, fairly common feature on EXPs and all were equipped with bubble backs and black taillights, both identical to the LN7 special characteristics. The base model 1.6 was no longer available in the EXPs. It would just be the 1.6 higher output carbureted engine, the 1.6 CFI, and the new 1.6 turbo. Lastly, 5 speeds would become the standard transmission for EXPs, with automatics being optional. So no more 4 speeds, and no more optional gear sets. The biggest news for 84 and 85 EXPs was the new Turbo Coupe model. After serious experimentation in 1981 through 1983 from Jack Roush, McLaren, and Ford's SVO, SVO and Roush were, were able to develop a 1.6 liter CVH EFI engine that was performance tuned and turbocharged for 120 horsepower, the most powerful motor out of all EXPs and Escorts. It had also had the most power per liter of any Ford production motor until that point. There would only be about 10,000 turbo EXPs made, all equipped with the following special features. Mustang-like seats with halo headrests, subtle rocker skirts and fender flares, turbo graphics over the black lower two-tones, EXP script on the C-pillar sail, an optional sunroof, optional AC, standard power steering, standard 5-speed, no automatics being optional, Coney struts and shocks, TR springs, thicker front sway bar, a front chin spoiler, TRX tires on special turbo wheels, the turbocharged 1.6 CVH built by SVO, and a rear spoiler which would have a center tail light come 1985. It would also be standard on the Hall EXPs from 85 and a half forward. In the lower left corner you can see an EXP prototype with an LN7 nose cone on it, most likely for better cooling ability during testing. 
Halfway through 1985 was the end of the first gen EXPs, and the end of 85 saw the production of the new 86 EXPs. A few important changes occurred between the 84 to 85 years and the 86 model year, but not many. The 86 through 88s had most noticeably got a different front end, almost the exact same as the 86 Escort GTs actually, and it had new single piece wraparound molded bumpers and select trims, had rocker skirts and fender flares as well. This makes them rather difficult to tell apart from Escort GTs, especially since Ford started marketing the EXPs as Escort EXPs. And if you knew it wasn't an Escort, you might have thought that they were Mustangs as they too got smoothed over for a similar look. But look out for the corner window, hatchback, and roofline. Those all give EXPs away as they have the biggest hatch, the lowest height, and the smallest corner windows out of those three cars. The 86 through 88s would also come with standard 14 inch wheels with 15s being optional instead of the first gen's 13 inch, 14 inch, and metric TRX wheels. Side mirrors were also updated to square mirrors like that on the new Escorts. And lastly, the 1.6 liter engines were no more. They were all replaced with 1.9 CVHs, which were the same in many ways, but the block was cast at about a quarter of an inch taller, making them non-interference. So should the timing belt break, the pistons won't ruin the head, which was a common issue with the 1.6. This also allowed for slightly more bore and stroke. The new 1.9s would come in three forms without the second gens. For 86, there was a carbureted 1.9 at 90 horsepower and a 1.9 EFI high output motor, which featured sequential polar fuel injection like the 1.6 EFI in the turbo engines, but this one would make 110 horsepower. Come 1987, the carburetor motor would become a CFI motor for standing for a central fuel injection. It crudely replaces a carburetor with a lone fuel injector and butterfly valve to make 90 horsepower with roller lifters and camshafts. The 1.9 EFI high output was still available, but as years went on, it would get up to 115 horsepower and would come with roller lifters and roller camshaft to prevent cam lobe wear like the CFI. This is something that the flat tappet motors greatly suffered from. But all these changes didn't sell a car as much better than the 84 to 85 years. So due to sales dwindling every year, 1988 would be the last year of EXPs, totaling at 225,000 cars, or 265,000 when you include the L7. Its quote-unquote replacement would be the new Ford Probe, but this was more coincidence than arrangement as smaller two-door sales were continually dropping as evident by Probe and later ZX2 sales. This ends the chronological production tale of the EXP and L7, but the story is far from over. In 1982, Ford was throwing tons of money at their EXPs and L7s. Millions of dollars by the time they discontinued the EXP in 88. Everyone expected the new EXP and L7 to become the new Mustang and Cougar or Capri, but as close as it got, it just never happened. But regardless, Ford's plan was to make a convertible two-door again. The first one since the 72 and 73 Mustang, actually. Before even the 80s convertible Mustang, there were these. These EXPs and LN7s started out as normal versions of their respective models. Then Ford sent them out to conversion companies to be made into convertibles. About 50 cars in total were sent out to companies across North America to be converted. Whoever did it the best would either be contracted by Ford to make all the EXP and LN7 convertibles for Ford, or Ford would buy their design to allow them, Ford, to build those cars in the house at one of the Ford factories. All of the shown examples, however, costed far more than their potential worth, so the idea was scratched and production ended with these. My convertible I mentioned earlier is one on the top right with its placard below it. The XP below that was crushed years ago, but is suspected to be from the same company as the red LN7 in the center. The black EXP on the far left was converted by a company in Pittsburgh, and the white LN7s on the left are the same car as seen in a later episode of Chips, converted from a California company. Another dozen or so EXPs were sent out in 1981 on a different mission to become EVs, electric vehicles, or natural gas cars. Many went to a couple EV conversion companies, but the gas conversion companies are quite unknown. 
The outcome of both, however, were taken the same as the convertibles. It simply costed far too much for production, so production halted after the few examples. Though some, some companies would go first to convert some EXPs for private customers without Ford support. One of the biggest kept secrets of AFC and McLaren was the production of one or two 1982 EXPs. If you contact them, they claim to know nothing about these, despite the existence of this one real example. And with there being so little info on this car, it makes it hard to share about. An article supposedly exists on it in a car and driver magazine from 81 or 82, but I haven't been able to get a hold of one. However, this car has some obvious special features. It has a true notchback hatch, a spoiler like that of an earlier EXP prototype, a chin spoiler like that of the turbo EXPs, a full set of European Escort alloy wheels, a pop-up sunroof like what the production cars would have, aerodynamic headlight covers, McLaren seats, added gauges on the stock dashboard, and under the hood a supercharged and supposedly turbocharged custom EFI 1.6 liter CVH making 120 horsepower. Ford of course later turbocharged their own 1.6s and made 120 horsepower that way. It used to belong to a huge EXP collector but has since been sold at least once and hasn't been seen since around 2010. The LN7 despite selling in less numbers had a grander release and bigger promotions which we'll go over later but from its release it had more potential through Ford Motorsport. Both the LN7 and EXP had special dealer available add-ons from conception as seen in the two lower photos. These special body parts like the rear spoiler and front chin spoiler found their way into this motorsport catalog magazine onto LN7's dubbed GT3s. Other photos of either don't seem to exist. However, a similar LN7 racer would become a land speed racer. One of the LN7 land speed racers was Larry Wilcox from Chips. He and his co-driver set 27 or so speed records. A few still stand. Later, there would be two other land speed EXPs and LN7s driven by private owners. One would be another semi-stock class like Ford's fitted with a larger CVH with plenty of power to reach 155 miles per hour. The other was a biofuel machine with an unknown powertrain. Ford's other support for EXPs and LN7s resided in a few drag cars, such as the Blue Max and Budweiser King Funny Cars and Bob Glidden's Pro Street EXP. In the top left photo, there is a matching streetcar next to his, but little is known about it. Many others have used EXPs for drag cars as the large fender flares allow for easing topping of the rear end. The bodies are pretty cheap. It has the lowest profile of all the 80s Fords. It has the footprint of a Fox body Mustang, and it has a long enough hood to hide any big plug V8 with a scoop. Glidden's was over 500 cubic inches. The funny cars had had similarly sized V8 Hemis. One of the funny cars, the Budweiser King, had a sweet stakes to match. Winners would get free t event tickets or a Budweiser King go-kart. Grand prize winners could win a normal LN7 replica. Many go-karts exist, but only one to three streetcars were made. Another sweepstake included the LN7, this one far more fancy from Weinstocks in their Fashion Cashin event to win a very rare LN7 Scoundrel 500 dressed in a brilliant purple with gold pinstriping and topped off with a white interior very rare to only 1982 EXP and LN7s. No photos exist outside this one, and it is unknown how many were produced. There once was a time EXPs and LN7s were even used in SCCA events. Only a few 82s and 83s were made that way, while some others were converted. Still, very few photos of each seem to exist. The top right car was made for rally races powered by a V8 and rear-wheel drive, of course. The lower center car was an LN7 for circuit road racing. It was sold a few years ago, but then parred out by its owner before being resold to its current owner. The lower left car is an EXP with less known history. It might not be a genuine Ford racer, but it was up for sale this Christmas. The top left car is one of the genuine Ford SCC factory race cars. Nothing is known about this one, and only this one photo of it can be found. The center top car is a second gen replica made by an EXP owner's member. Uh, made to impressive standards, and still gets raced. Remember the Motorsports LN7s I mentioned? 
There was a similar one made for the 1981 PPG Kart Indy World Car Series as a pace car. The body was built by a group effort between Ford, SVO, Jack Roush, and the American Sunroof Company, ASC. The body hosted a million significant changes between the front chin spoiler, rear spoiler, wraparound molded bumpers, full skirts between the wheels, a redesigned front clip, custom taillights, a clear light bucket lens cover set for aero speed, and custom vents around the body for brake cooling. The interior isn't much far from stock, just with the addition of more gauges and warning lights. The SC McLaren seats, roll cage, and full safety systems were the additions. Suspension-wise, it was lowered, the spring rate was increased, the rear suspension was redesigned, Coney shocks were added, and as was a thicker sway bar. The transmission was simply an Escort 4-speed, regeared, and blueprinted to an aircraft level to handle 180 horsepower, 7,000 RPMs of input from the engine, and speeds of around 120 miles per hour. The 1.6-liter CVH engine was built up by Jack Roush and Ford's SVO to an extreme, making 180 horsepower at only 8 psi of boost through a revised two-barrel carburetor, all electronically limited to 7,000 RPMs with the stock North American cam. You can see it resides in the Roush Racing Museum, right beside its twin, the 1982 EXP PPG pace car. Little is known about the EXP, but a quick look would tell you that it sure doesn't look like one. The body has also been reworked so far that only the windows and roof seem to be original. With the body widened in each corner, we can only imagine what's inside for a motor. Either another heavily modified 1.6, or possibly something else. The last DXP on our docket for today is again something rare, something unseen besides these photos even. You're welcome to read the article I've included for you here. I have no additional information on it. The left photo is of an engine bay of a GN34 car at the Roush Museum. Uh, for those who don't know, GN34 is Ford's program for the V6 SV SHO before it wound up in the 89 to 95 Taurus. This more or less concludes our video for the Ford EXP in Mercury and Allen 7. Again, if you're picking for more, visit the Ford Wikipedia page. I'll have future videos on some specific pot topics, so please stay tuned, and we'll see you later, guys.